it is a huge honor today to be interviewing an orthodontist all the way from Italy, Fabio Savastano. Did I say that right, Savastano? Perfect. Perfect. And um, you, you were actually, you were born in Italy, but you learned perfect English by, um, as a child, you moved to Washington, D.C. Your father was in the embassy? Exactly. He was also a teacher at the University of Maryland. And uh, I grew up there, and uh, by 1975, I had gone back to Naples. And how old were you in 1975? 1975, uh, I was 14. So, so, so you spoke English here for uh, 12, 13 years. Is, it very, is English very common um, to speak it as fluently as you do among dentists in Italy? Absolutely not. Absolutely not? Quite rare. Quite rare? Actually. What about reading English? A lot, a lot of times you meet a dentist who can't speak English, but they read English. How common is it to be able to read English among dentists in Italy? That's a little bit more common because all the good publications are in English. So if you want to make a publication or, you know, uh, update yourself and you, you have to do it through the web. So you're speaking English, you're reading English, not speaking it. A, lo a lot of um, a lot of dentists, where English is a second language, say they can read it, but they don't really like to read it in English. They say after about an hour, it gives them a headache. Uh, I don't speak a second language. Um, is that is that a common thing where you uh, you hear that if they like get on Dental Town and they're reading posts after about an hour of reading a second language, the brain is fried? Yeah, well, it's just, it's not that easy. I mean, any second language. Um, uh, for example, I know a little bit of French. But I can only take it for about 40 minutes. I can't take more than that, really. So I, I, I guess a lot of Italians get tired of the English after about half an hour, you know. Uh, I have my son. He's going to go into university next year. And uh, I sent him a, a whole month in England. He came back. Uh, he can handle a little bit more than an hour now, you know. So it's a question of how fluent you are with the language, uh, uh, how much time you've been speaking with friends, and, uh, and probably... Um, how much you've had to do with other dentists also that speak your same language. So if Italian dentists speak English, they don't get to meet the English speaking doctors. They, they won't get as fluent in, you know, in the language as they should. So is a language like riding a bicycle? I mean, do you see yourself losing your English over the years or is it, you know, since you spoke it fluently at 14 living in the States, will you always be able to speak English or do you find yourself losing it? Well, actually, you're supposed to lose it. I keep it up because uh, I travel worldwide and I have my lectures worldwide in English. And plus, uh, my mother lived in the States until four or five years ago when she passed away. And um, I used to go and see her. So um, I, I bring my family on vacation in Las Vegas, you know, when I can because they want to go around the parks and, you know, have fun. So I guess um, you have to keep up a language. Uh, language. So... Um, France is right by me. I'm just about 20 minutes away from France, and I have some French friends, and I go to see them all the time, and I keep up my French a little, but I should do more than that. I speak Greek as well, so when I see the Greek friends, I start speaking Greek with them, you know. And uh, Neapolitan is a dialect, but actually it's a language, so I speak Neapolitan as well. Maybe you guys have uh, heard on a TV show, it's called Gomorrah. Now you have it in uh, native Neapolitan language, it's about mafia. And it, it has, um, uh, it, it's, it's written in English, so you can see the, you know, what the, the, the actors are saying in English. It's, it should be pretty cool if you can get that on a DVD. I, I want to start with the most controversial question in orthodontics that I see. Um, in the United States, the American Dental Association recognize, recognizes nine specialties. And besides orthodontics, the other eight, they pretty much all have a culture that um, like endodontists and oral surgeons, uh, we're, we'll, we'll help you with all the information you need because um, like an endodontist, you know, I'll, I'll help you with all the endo. I'm sure you'll do all the single canals and a lot of the bicuspids, but you'll, you'll give me the hard cases. Um, oral surgeons, they'll, they'll help you pull any routine teeth, whatever, because they know that the difficult ones like impacted wisdom teeth, you're going to send there. But it seems like orthodontists... Um, they don't like to share any information with general dentists. You no, almost never, ever, ever see an orthodontist lecturing to general dentists at any convention in America. Um, and uh, they just, they just, they only keep to themselves. It's, it's kind of a closed club. And I was wondering, is that, 
a, a cultural thing only with orthodontists in America, or do you see that in Italy too? Like, do your orthodontist friends not like you teaching uh, general dentists how to do orthodontics? Okay, first of all, the last thing you said is true. Uh, my other friend orthodontist don't want me to teach general orthodontics to ge general dentists, okay? So it is true, there is a little bit of uh, jealousy, I'd say. Uh, it, we're a little closed. Um, I tried to break that down, um, uh, plus I practice the type of orthodontics that I'm not only hated by other orthodontists, I'm hated from <laughs> a lot of general dentists, you know, so that's neuromuscular dentistry, okay? So um, I'm hated all around, but uh, I, I, tried, I, tried, I tried my best to, to, to speak to everybody. I believe uh, that the, the higher the communication, um, the, the better living for everybody. I'm not for the idea that orthodontists should be, you know, just kept aside and minding their own business and being a super specialistic. That's, that, I feel that is quite unfair. On the other hand, there are some... Uh, there is part of the orthodontic specialty that cannot be comprehended e easily from the general dentist. I'm talking about occlusion and TMD problems, okay? Uh, there is a problem of communication there because when a general orthodontist, uh, when a, uh, an orthodontist speaks and talks to a general dentist about occlusion and TMD problems, uh, there is uh, a, a big gap, a big cultural gap there. Um, on the other hand, you have to understand that the idea of occlusion has been changing in the recent years. So you've got a lot of dentists who are still thinking of occlusion the old way, and you've got new orthodontists that are just speaking with new language. So that, that's, I, I think that's a, a cultural gap, most of all. It just takes patience. So, yeah, the, the reason it concerns me is, uh, you know, America, everybody thinks of, you know, New York and Vegas and D.C., but there's actually 19,000 small rural towns, and about 10% of them don't even have a general dentist, and another 10,000 don't even have a single specialist. So when you're sending these kids back to a rural town and there's only 1,800 people and nobody wants to teach them, you know, specialty work, then it really harms rural small town Americans. I agree 100 percent. Yeah. And that's, we always, when we, the same here in Europe, when we think of Europe we're, or Italy, we're thinking of Rome and Milan and the big cities and there's a lot of rural here also and a lot of general dentists would like to treat a little bit uh, of orthodontics to, you know, their patients and deliver uh, good treatments and it, it's the same here. It's, it's, it's a little, it's a little big problem in, in, in the sense that uh, you'll have uh, certainly the um, 50 or 60 percent of children that could go to the general dentist to have, you know, uh, the, the big problems relieved. And probably you need a, a specialist uh, to have the, you know, uh, more refined treatment and, you know, bigger problems treated for the, for the child. So we're, we're losing general dentists for this reason are losing a big 50 percent, a big chunk of uh, easy uh, practice uh, on the, of orthodontics on their children. So uh, what, I, what I would suggest is that, um, and there are associations who do this, there is a general orthodontic teaching for them. For example, uh, the uh, International Association of Orthodontics uh, is open uh, not only to specialists uh, ortho in orthodontics, but also to general practitioners. And I believe that they, they organize very good courses on about well, Lido Dental Town has put up 350 courses and they've been viewed over half a million times and I still have not been able to get an orthodontist to put an orthodontic course or curriculum on Dental Town and I've been trying since 1998 and uh, I mean it, it's just a no show and I mean you would think on Dental Town with 205,000 dentists that I could find one orthodontist to put a like a, a you know a 10 part course on diagnosing treatment planning, you know, a, a curriculum of how to do orthodontics. And I, I've never been able to find it. Okay. Let me say this. Um, there is one big difference between the orthodontics that most of us do here in Europe in the respect to that is done in the United States. For example, a lot of orthodontists here use functional appliances and, uh, 
it's not the same in the States. I don't know if it's for legal reasons, but you have also had an association for functional orthodontics in the United States that then it was absorbed by the International Association of Orthodontics, I believe. And um, this means that uh, we're treating uh, very economically, from one point of view, uh, a lot of children uh, that maybe don't have uh, the money to go into a fixed brace orthodontics in a second part of the treatment, but we uh, reduce uh, a lot of uh, class two occlusions and uh, class one malocclusions uh, simply with a functional appliance. What I'm saying is that I believe probably the first course that should be set up by Dental Town or Ortho Town should be a course on general functional orthodontics, which is inexpensive, it's very easy for rural uh, doctors, and uh, it can deliver uh, immediate, um, an immediate benefit to children. And it has also a very important significance uh, from, for interceptive therapy and uh, is seen uh, worldwide now even more as days pass, a very, very good type of treatment. So is this something Fabio might do? Oh, yeah, I could do that. It's, it's, Would you uh, really do that? Or why not? I, uh. I, I have to sign up for that. And I'll get another 100,000 orthodontists who hate me. But it's okay. <laughs> this is functional orthodontics. It's okay. <laughs> D D Dental talent will get you hated around the world. There'll be uh, dentists watching that from China to Brazil. I want to ask you the next um, most controversial question. I hope it doesn't offend you. There's a lot of dentists on Dental Town who say, you know what, Fabio, occlusion, it's all voodoo. When these people are chewing, their teeth don't even touch. What, what, how can you tell me occlusion matters when, when, they're, when the teeth almost never touch and when they're chewing, uh, they're just chewing on a bolus of food, their teeth don't touch, and, 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 and furthermore, the occlusion theory, every five years, it's a different theory. What would you say to those guys? Okay, first of all, <sighs> Centric occlusion only happens when you swallow, and it, it should happen only when you swallow, not when you chew. Um, so we talk of occlusion because uh, we talk of that full contact, that centric occlusion, as the moment in which one of the most and one of the least uh, functional, atomatic functional um, uh, reflexes happen, that is swallow. Swallow is, uh, swallow is uh, an automatic reflex that is, um, it, it's sort of like zeros and resets uh, all function. So it is very important that this reflex swallowing happens at the lowest possible uh, usage of energy. Whenever there is a malocclusion, the energy you need to swallow is higher than normal and you don't get a chance to reset easily all this the system so that's why occlusion is important because if the mandible is in a relaxed position and it slowly moves into a centric occlusion that will not strain muscles and tmj the swallow will use up very little energy, and you could probably swallow two times, one easily after another. If You can ask a patient if he's having TMD problems to swallow two times consequently, and he won't be able. He'll just swallow once, and then he'll take some time to swallow again. His system is using up a lot of energy. Now, this said this, uh, this type of a, uh, a balanced neuromuscular occlusion it has been it has been demonstrated to be uh, the best idea, the best system you can have to have a functional temporal mandibular joint. That means we do not have any accommodation from the joint and the muscles. Everything is relaxed. And I'm going to surprise you. Um, there's a French uh, professor of anatomy who uh, studied a thousand cadavers and uh, demonstrated that. On the, in the joint and on the ligament, the pterygoideus, the masseter, and the temporalis, all three muscles are on this ligament. 
and not only the Pteri Godeos as we thought, we thought until you know we, we learned at university. Now, if these muscles are all relaxed, don't you believe that the temporomandibular joint also is relaxed? So every type of occlusion must be a functional occlusion. That means these muscles must start their movement in a relaxed fashion. That's why electromyography has been used by a lot of dentists to prove that their occlusion was working fine, okay? Then mandibular uh, tracking systems came on in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, and they started demonstrating how fluid these movements, movements could be. And then from there, we also have neuromuscular dentistry, which is nothing I'm going to talk about today because it's quite complicated. But I'd say that centric occlusion in a balanced uh, function with relaxed muscles gets you to start that swallow. That swallow with low energy and easy to do is a reset of all your posture, craniocervical posture, and then probably also body posture. If you don't have that come in, coming in easily, if you do not swallow with your uh, teeth in centric occlusion, but you put your tongue in, in the middle, you know, and you're not swallowing correctly, that's going to affect all the craniocervical system. So could you summarize what are the main international occlusion um, camps called and why did you pick neuromuscular and could you could you describe the the basic different uh, theories of occlusion and then and then hone in on why you pick neuromuscular okay first of all I picked neuromuscular because uh, in the specialty where I was in Padua um, I I was friends with the um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Balercha and his father was a friend of uh, uh, Professor Jenkelson in Seattle. So he imported neuromuscular dentistry in Italy. And so I knew him and I was very influenced by him. Second and most important of all, I, I liked any, anything that, was, that had to do with physiology, with just reasoning. And for, most of all, I liked the idea of measuring something like measuring the, uh, the, the activity of the muscle with electromyography and uh, seeing the movements of the mandible. Um, and nothing could give me this that, would, that had not been uh, neuromuscular dentistry. On the other hand, uh, I understand that uh, occlusion uh, was seen very mechanically, at least when I was at school, Everything was, was, with orthodontics was very mechanical. Like, you know, we do cephalometric tracings like everybody does, and we calculate the millimeters, and then we look at the casts, and then we look at where the cuspids were used up, and then we were talking about how the teeth should be in a class one dental position. And this was all very mechanical, but it did not tell us for what reason the mandible should be in that position and how function was delivered once that occlusion was obtained. That's why I was interested in neuromuscular dentistry. And uh, there are a lot of occlusion theories uh, more or less, uh, uh, that have more or less uh, different uh, ideas, but the concept that is coming out in these uh, years is that uh, uh, there must be a conservation of function. Now that means you have to swallow correctly, your muscles have to be relaxed, and your TMJ has to work correctly. If these, these three basic uh, functions are not preserved, the occlusion you have gained is not a functional occlusion. It won't work properly, and you're just creating a stress to the system. And you'll see that in a lot of, uh, in, in the changes we've had in orthodontics, where once uh, there was a lot of extraction orthodontics and a lot of flattening of the mouth and, and pulling back the teeth in class two, and now we're trying to move face forward, coming forward with the mandible and not flattening the profiles as it was done once. So there has been a change in orthodontics as well as in, uh, in, in ethology where dentists were very mechanical at the beginning, and now research has demonstrated certain very important principles about the uh, mastication cycles, centric occlusion, uh, that uh, uh, have 
change the idea, the views of the general and, spe and the specialist, uh, the dentist of specialty in, or in orthodontics and ethology. So how much of your practice is um, orthodontics versus uh, TMJ and TMD? Uh, it's usually about the 70-30. 70% regular orthodontics and 30% TMJ? Did you say yes? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and um, how, do, how are you diagnosing uh, TMJ and... What what is what is your standard? They're, they're, you're, they're coming in with symptoms, and then what are you doing going doing from there? Well, symptoms are usually headache and uh, jaw pain, and uh, ear problems sometimes, and neck pain. And um, first of all, diagnostics is clinical, and once you uh, you have an idea that patient has a temporal mandibular disorder, and um, first. The first thing you want to do is treat pain, and to do that, uh, according to the level of pain, if the pain is tolerable, you can uh, start doing a functional analysis. That means uh, complete mandibular scan, electromyography, and creating a bite for this person, which is called orthotic in neuromuscular dentistry. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes pain is very high, is, um, and you can't just start treating and taking casts and trying to find a, 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 a problem inclusion. So probably the first thing you want to do there is treat very strong pain. So you'll go into more pharmacological uh, side and uh, there are little tricks uh, <laughs> that whoever treats TMD, TMD knows. And uh, so you'll probably want to treat pain first. But diagnostics uh, for neuromuscular dentist would be to use mandibular, uh, mandibular scanning and then electromyography and creating a proper bite. Usually in about 90, 95% of the cases, pain is gone like that in about uh, two, one or two days. So uh, that's no big deal. I mean, whoever does neuromuscular dentistry knows this, but uh, nobody believes us. <laughs> it's a fact, it's not, it's not an opinion. So what, what equipment are you using for this? No, I'll show you. The brand name and the equipment. I got it here. Show you right away. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, this would be my Myotronics K7. K7 evaluation system. Exactly. There you go. Who makes that? Myotronics Seattle. That's my laptop. And um, and then we have uh, this is a tens machine, which we relax muscles with. And that's the uh, Myo monitor. Is that also made by Myotronics in Seattle? Yes, sir. And then we have uh, the preamplifier of the EM EMG. That's also made for Myotronics. The whole system, the whole system is. Uh, it's fantastic. The, 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 the only problem is you have to study <laughs> to get the know how to work properly all this type of machinery and not all dentists are willing to do that. And that's part of the refusal. We're measuring things here and we can just print, print out uh, uh, a whole case and we, we know what's going on with the patient 100%. And does Dr. Jekyllson still run the company? And his son, Bob Jenkelson, run, runs the company now. Yeah. His son, Bob Jenkelson? What's his, did his, his, what's his father do? Uh, his father his father's not with us anymore, I believe. And um, uh, his son now runs the company, but most of all lectures around the world. And uh, Dr. Frey Adib, I think, I believe he's the head now of Myotronics, the CEO. Wow. And back to pharmacological pain, what are you prescribing for pharmacological pain for that acute patient? Well, uh, first of all, I'm a medical doctor, so I can, uh, I don't know how it is in the States, but I, 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 I can order some types of, uh, of uh, pain relief uh, uh, pills that probably dentists could not. But in severe cases, I've uh, used... Uh, uh, some dairy rates of morphine and in severe cases and amitriptyline.
And what? Amitriptyline is a hypothalamic state amitriptyline. Uh huh. Okay, that's an antidepressive. That at low doses, uh, 10, 10, 20 milligrams is uh, probably also very effective in the in the, uh, hiring the the um, uh, the tolerance to pain. And and this and then um. So this Myotronics has been very uh, successful for you. How long have you been using this? Oh, I started with a K5 AR, which is an oscilloscope. I started in 1987, working on a K5. Then a K, I bought a K5 AR, that's big oscilloscope. It was very complicated to do mandibular tracking then. And uh, then I moved to you know the computerized systems. The one that you see now is very compact. It's quite easily easy to use. It's quite easy to use. And right now you're the president of the International College of Neuromuscular Orthodontics and Nathology. Congratulations on that. Well, I, I've uh, I founded this uh, association um, more or less about ten years ago, and it was part of an older association. It's a nonprofit association. And to deliver um, uh, the ideas of neuromuscular orthodontics. And uh, myself and a very good colleague of mine in Genoa, Dr. Piero Silvestrini, uh, we lectured around the world. And we lectured in over 750 uh, doctors only in, India, only in India. Wow. Wow. And so what, do, what is the website for the... Uh... International College of Neuromuscular Orthodontics and Anthology. Is it I ICNOG.com. ICNOG.com. And how, how many members you have on there now? Um, the members are automatically set up in my, um, in my uh, uh, mailing list. And I have a global mailing list is about uh, 7,000. But I believe about 2,800 are... Uh, members that apply directly because uh, they 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 had a direct application to the website. And why do you think neuromuscular is controversial for you? Why why do you why do you think it's so controversial? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> well, um, one one of the first controversies that was set some years ago was that. Uh, was about the use of this machine, the ultra low frequency tens. A lot of doctors said that whenever you use the tens, you always have the mandible coming forward, and uh, that was no really rest position. Well, I think that was kind of uh, we kind of went over that, and that was demonstrated from a lot of publication that uh, that this is not true. And then the other the other big problem we have in uh, neuromuscular dentistry is that there are some doctors uh, that still continue uh, to state that uh, TMD problems are mainly psychological and um, do not come from occlusion. And I don't know what to say about this. There are so many publications and uh, that demonstrate obviously uh, the opposite. But uh, there are still uh, some doctors that uh, fight forcefully that uh, want to continue to state to state that uh, TMD problems do not come from occlusion or in any way that occlusion is only uh, responsible for the for very small part of the TMD problem. Now this is the the big debate we have. Then there is another big problem that if you want to be a, a good neuromuscular dentist, you have to buy the equipment. Okay, not all dentists can afford to buy the equipment. It's not that it's that expensive, but there are a lot of dentists who are not willing to spend extra money. You know, why? I'll show you. Because when you start buying a CBT and you go into milling your own things in your office and working on a hundred computers and you're spending two hundred. K for all this stuff, you don't want to spend another 30 or 40 K for anything else. You're getting tired. You want to buy you want to buy your Porsche, right? You want to buy your Ferrari. And you're taking away money from that. And you 
probably think you can treat TMD just by putting something, uh, any sort of bite in the mouth and make it very economical for you. And this, to use the system takes time. You have to do courses, you have to study, uh, there's confrontation with other doctors, uh, and the courses, the courses sometimes, sometimes can be expensive. And uh, not everybody wants to go through this, so that's why we have this small community. It's getting larger, though. It's getting larger. Small community of neuromuscular dentists around the world. And there's also, um, do you think there also has to be a hormonal element to uh, TMD because women get it so much more than men? What, what, do you agree that women get it more than men? And why do you think that is? Yeah, well, women absolutely get it more than men. Uh, there are certain different reasons. Okay, one is probably hormones have something to do with this. We know that uh, during the, the uh, women's cycle, uh, monthly cycle, there is uh, an aggravation of TMD symptoms. So probably hormones do have an influence. There are some publication, uh, publications, on the other hand, that demonstrated that uh, um, uh, very strong headaches that are typically vascular and not uh, from muscular tension uh, do behave better if they're having a, a proper occlusion settled. That means if you put an orthotic in a patient who has migraine headaches, uh, sometimes he'll feel better. So I think there is an interconnection between anything that is vascular and has to do uh, with uh, an orthotic, uh, the treatment of the neuromuscular dentist. There also are publications that demonstrate that an orthotic, when well done with the neuromuscular concepts, it increases blood flow uh, to the central nervous system. So there are, there are big discoveries coming out which demonstrate that there is a link. And hormones, of course, play an important role. On the other hand, men tend to tolerate more pain. So their level of tolerance is, is higher, and so they come less to the office. But there are a lot of men who have TMD and just support it, you know, just go over it. Uh, a woman will probably uh, be alarmed easier and will not tolerate that sort of pain. And I think uh, maybe the, the third, uh, the third uh, concept that uh, makes us all agree that women have uh, TMD problems uh, and they suffer from TMD problems more is that probably the level of stress sometimes for women with children and a job and a husband is that level of stress uh, lowers their tolerance and therefore there are more symptoms. Yeah, my, my ex-wife said divorcing me was the best thing she did for her TMJ. <laughs> <laughs> I just cracked up my son. Um, is there a, an age parameter with women when they seem to seek treatment for TMJ more? Is there a, do you, do you see most of the women falling between certain age parameters? Yes. Uh, it, it depends also in the country you are. I'll tell you the truth. Because I was talking to a, a, a doctor from Saudi Arabia, and women get uh, married there uh, at 16 sometimes, at 17. So they have children when they're 17 or 18. And we don't see that anymore in our country. So very rare. And they get into a lot of stress, a lot of work. And they, they see patients, women patients with TMD around 25, 26, 27 uh, maximum age. Okay. And uh, in my office, women with TMD are usually from about 25 to 35 in age, maximum 40. And I, I, I've talked with other doctors in the United States, and they say they have different ranges, sometimes from 30 to 40. So uh, obviously um, there is a difference, but I, that's why I link it a lot to the level of stress when you have family and kids. Plus, you know, and there are countries where women have like seven or eight kids. We don't see that in Italy. I don't know in the States, but, you know, seven or eight kids, then you run to a job, you run back, and if you have a little bit of, you probably don't chew your teeth as well as you should, you know, and you probably have a little bit of malocclusion. It all starts, and, 
and then it just won't go away and you can't sleep well at night. Uh, one of the first questions I asked my TMD patients, how many hours they sleep? I want to be sure they sleep eight hours and I'm going to put them to sleep eight hours no, no matter what, okay? Uh, to cure a TMD patient, first of all, you have to have all the basics there, you know? I was talking to a Dr. Silvana Barrage from um, Tirana, Albania, and she um, goes to Cairo, Egypt. And she was telling me how exactly what you said, that there's just so much more um, TMJ in, uh, in Egypt than there is just like in Albania among the women there in Egypt. I've, uh, I've met a lot of Egypt, Egyptian doctors, <clears throat> and um, there, there are now many doctors uh, in Cairo several doctors in Cairo I've met that treat only TMD problems and their, their TMD problems come a lot from missing teeth. There are a lot of young people who miss a lot of teeth and so they have a lot of jaw problems and that bring them, brings them TMD problems. And it's quite different from what we're seeing in our countries in which uh, maximum you get is a one or two missing teeth. They have sometimes uh, full arch missing in young people. And with no occlusion, uh, TMD strain is, TMJ strain is easy. And they're treating a lot of people there. There's big numbers, big numbers. Um, just for, um, I'd like to get your explanation on your International College of Neuromuscular Orthodontics and Nathology. Explain the difference in orthodontics and nathology. Oh, great. Uh, orthodontics is... Uh, we, we, I move crooked teeth, okay, with one objective that is a, a, a good functional occlusion. Neathology is the whole study of the occlusion on the individual when he has a TMD problem. Because when he has a TMD problem, if his uh, level of tolerance is very small, that means you have to be very precise. And that's when all your neathological study comes in and neathology deals a lot with uh, uh, obtaining uh, uh, and fixing, fine fixing an occlusion and uh, fixing an orthotic that is very precise to the pres prescription. And th then these word originations, you know, I grew up, I um, went to Catholic high school, Catholic college, all that. And uh, so I took Latin and all that. And I once had a, a Latin priest say, you know, all, the, all these words originate from Latin or Greece, but he said, we're, um, but he said most of Latin was, you know, back to Greece uh, from Spartans and Athens. Would you say almost all Latin um, comes originally from Greece? I mean, would you say nathology is a Greek word or a Latin word? Nathos. Nathos uh, uh, is a Greek word, okay? Uh, and when we specialized in orthodontics in Italy, it's, it's a specialization in ortho, gnato, donzia. Ortho means straight. Gnato is, is the mandible, the bones. And donzia, ortho, gnato, donzia comes from teeth. Dontic, when you say dontic, okay? Uh, from donzia is also uh, in, uh, origins in Latin. So the big word of our specialty is ortho, mythology, and teeth, okay? So, yes, it comes all from Greek. All Absolutely. Greek. Interesting. So let's switch gears uh, back from uh, neuromuscular back to orthodontics. Um, talk, talk to, you're, you're talking to thousands of American dentists, um, at least half in small rural areas. Um, what could they be doing more with removable appliance uh, in their office um, with, with children, as you were talking about? Okay, first of all, there are a lot of class two occlusions we see. Easily a general dentist, when there's no opportunity for this child to go to a, a, someone who does only orthodontics or a specialist, you know, first thing he can do is just probably expand the upper arch and use a functional appliance. He doesn't have to put on brackets, you know, braces, and, you know, he doesn't, have to use all his, all the complicated things that come with fixed appliances. So we're talking of a removable appliance and a fixed appliance only if 
we want to use a rapid palatal expander, which is very simple. After rapid palatal expansion, a functional appliances, a functional appliance uh, will change the, the aspect, the face of the child, and will solve the, the big overjet. Once that is done, you've done 80% of what you're supposed to do in orthodontics. That other 20% is probably your fixed appliance to, to straighten teeth to a perfect occlusion. But if that doesn't happen, you've treated already 80%, and that's a lot you can do in a rural area. And what age range would this child be? Oh, from uh, 7 to 13, 14, no problem. And you, you think you might build, build us an online course on this on Dentaltown? Sure, why not? I, I would love that because so many of them, and, and plus in rural communities, a lot of times when you tell your, your patient, uh, you really need to drive an hour to the big city and get this done. And then the parents are like, I don't have time for this. Yeah. And, and, then, and then the schools, then the schools graduate this kid without any, he doesn't have any experience in it. The, the parents aren't motivated enough to drive an hour into town. And uh, so I think this is a, something that online continuing education can really help these uh, dentists treat their patients better. Sure. That's, I think that's a great idea. Uh, I, I just like to remind uh, what the general dentist can do. Like when he's done that 70, 80% of, you know, bringing the mandible forward and expanding the upper arch, the time that is needed for the fixed appliance, the specialty thing, the driving one hour to, you know, to the city is, is only done for a lot less time and with a lot less expense. So that means that that part of sacrifice that, you know, probably the parents wouldn't do for three years would probably do it for six months or a year. So that changes the whole aspect of treatment. So Absolutely. So you're 70% orthodontics, 30% TMJ or TMD. Uh, on your 70% orthodontics, what percent of that is fixed uh, uh, hardwire braces, bands, brackets versus removable appliances? Okay. My daughter is in dental school in Valencia, in Spain. Okay. I can't wait to have her in my office because the day she's in my office, I won't want to touch any more, any fixed appliance, like brackets and, you know, braces and wires. That'd be great for me. I, all I have to do is functional appliances. I can use them all, change the faces of my children, and then my daughter comes and does the fixed alignment at the end, okay? So whenever I can use a functional appliance, I'm going to use it in my patient, okay? At the moment, out of 100 patients, I'd say about 60 or 65% all have used a functional appliance, okay? Obviously not 100%. Not all patients need a functional appliance, but a lot can do with, and the results are amazing. And they, a lot of orthodontists hate me for this too. And what, what do you think is actually causing class twos and class threes? Would you say it's just simple genetics? They were just born for this to happen? Well, genetics, uh, of course, play a role. You know, you see uh, a lot of class two uh, uh, mothers, you know, with, with big upper tight maxilla breathing problems, and you'll probably have the child that is the same. Uh, so I think one of the main reasons we see a lot of class two is about uh, thumb sucking and respiratory problems. And thumb sucking will just keep the mandible back and push the upper maxilla forward and, and will not deliver the proper physio physiologic, uh, physiological ambience for the, the tongue to move properly and will not expand the upper maxilla. And uh, this has been demonstrated from a lot of, uh, of, uh, of publications that uh, in order to have a, a good function, you have to breathe correctly. And so, uh, what we do now is that we look a lot at how, how the child is breathing. Uh, I usually, the first thing a, a class two occlusion, I do with a class two occlusion is I assess the quality of breathing of the child, obviously. And then of course the part of functions. So if the child is, uh, you know, chewing on, 
it's thumb or it's thumb sucking, you know, that's a big problem we have to deal with. There's a lot of psychological work also for, you know, for the orthodontist. He's got a lot of things to work on. And a lot of these dentists listening to you right now, I mean, they have, they have children of their own. You know, I, I raised four boys. Uh, I had a thumb sucker. When do you think thumb sucking has to stop uh, before it's going to cause an orthodontic pr an issue? You know, did you ever see uh, those, um, uh, did you ever see the little baby uh, uh, on, the, on the scan? You know, when mother is about eight or nine months and he's already thumb sucking. So it, that's when it starts sometimes. And I believe in order not to risk, okay, before 24 months. So at age Any? two, they got to stop. Yeah, I've seen these, these. You're talking about ultrasounds where they're showing these babies yeah. in the womb sucking their right. thumb. So uh, if you can get them to stop before 24 months, of course, the, the idea, the ideal is, is much earlier. But, or have them not to stop, suck at all. But having, to, having them suck to age three, four, five can, you know, start creating some problems. On the other hand, uh, Something very interesting is that these thumb suckers and um, thumb suckers, uh, when they are very small and I get to see them, you know, of course I don't treat a child of 24 or 48 months, but what I do is if the parents can get to stop them ch ch sucking on their thumb, I'll send the, the, the babies to an osteopath and he'll do some uh, cranial ma manipulation and Believe it or not, I, I, I've seen big differences after osteopathic intervention on these small children. And it's, it's getting very interesting now in how osteopathy, how a, cure, a, a chiropractor can help re-equilibrate this, this disequilibrium of the cranium that is going on already at that, at that age. And that interests us in orthodontists a lot. You know, it's funny because... Um... Dentists in America uh, are very against uh, alternative health care, holistic medicine, all these things like that. And I think they, they have blinders on because, you know, a businessman should always be listening to the market. And in my 53 years, I have sensed a growing distrust of the American medical system where, you know, they're always trying to make you take a pharmaceutical pill and doing some surgery. Like I had my, you know, I, my mom took me to the doctor. I was sick. So what they do, they ripped out my tonsils and adenoids. You know, it's just, you know, and, and now it, um, that probably wouldn't happen in 2015. And uh, it's funny um, that the market is growing alternative medicine, holistic, naturopath. And it just seems like every smart old man I talk to will exhaust every natural alternative before they'll go to the doctor because they know he's just going to want to write him a prescription for a pill and uh, or, or do a surgery and cut something off. I mean, it almost goes back to the ancient medicine man where you went to the medicine man, he made you a lotion or a potion, did a dance, and then pulled out his knife and cut something off. You have a very unique alternative that you're extremely familiar with both the United States and the Italian um, uh, dental communities. Um, what, what would you say, are, are there any real differences between the Italian uh, dental community and American as far as like insurance reimbursement, water fluoridation, um, types of treatment, specialties, any any differences that might be unique or interesting? Yeah, there are some differences. You know, we're all a big family when we're talking about dentistry. You know, it's, you know, we're more or less, we're, we're all the same. You know, when I speak to other dentists, they like cars like I like, and they want to show them off. I don't show off my car anyway. But, you know, a lot of dentists are golfers. I'm a golfer. I go golfing and there are a lot of dentists because we have, sometimes we can get our free time when we want, you know? So we have a lot of things in common. Uh, what the big difference between us Europeans and you Americans as a job is that you have a lot of legal thing. You have a lot of legal things. Like whatever procedure you do has to be a standardized procedure that is very legal and you can get stuck with it. If, and you can get a lawyer uh, run after you, okay? Uh, for us, it's a little different. Uh, what a dentist or a medical doctor is in Europe is an artist. It's an art. It's a profession of art. And that means that a lot has to come 
from our personal judgment and treatment alternatives, most of all, and I'll give you something in that here, have to be primum non nocere. That means, first of all, you're not supposed to harm the patient. That's why we are very open to holistic medicine. And that's why we've had some fantastic orthodontics, orthodontists and uh, European doctors write fantastic books, like Professor Desjayet, she's French, and she started treating uh, skeletal problems of orthodontics and maxillofacial interest using the help, with the help of an osteopath and chiropractor. And she's become very famous. And there are a lot of doctors that have come from the United States for her courses. And this happens every day in Europe. Um, we try to be very open uh, to alternatives that do not harm the patient, that can only do some good. I mean, this is one of the reasons why uh, the procedure of functional appliances in America doesn't work that well. Why? Because when I deliver a functional appliance, if I don't have the kid bring it, you know, carry the appliance in his mouth for at least 15 or 16 hours, I'm getting no results. And I can get sued for that. And nobody wants that. So the no compliance therapy, which was born in the States, is getting worldwide because, you know, it, it's very easy for the orthodontist to just, you know, deliver a fixed appliance where there's no compliance. So patient doesn't have to do anything and he gets the results. That's very mechanical. It's not very muscle function. That's what functional orthodontics is. So there's the big difference, okay? You guys have to deliver in that timetable, time that result, or you get sued. Uh, in our country, you get sued if you do something really bad and really wrong. So we have more space to deliver treatment options. You know, the United States has one million attorneys, and I've been, I want to get a law passed that every time we take refugees from a country, we send them the exact same number of our attorneys. So if you want to send us 200,000 Syrians, we'll give you 200,000 of our attorneys. We'll just make it an even trade. <laughs> and, and yeah, the, I, I see so much more alternative health care um, in Europe, like uh, Marcin Dolecki, a dentist in um, Warsaw, Poland. I mean, he calls himself a chiro dentist uh, and, um, you know, chi chiro dentics. And he uh, considers himself half chiropractor, half dentist. And, it's chi and he calls it chirodontics. And they're just extremely successful in Warsaw, Poland. And, and he's like, you know, there's, there's not a chance this would ever take place in the United States. And I've been in his practice, and I've watched him treat patients all day long. And, I mean, it's just, just amazing. I, I love it. And this is what the Internet can do. Like, I can't believe I'm sitting here on a Friday at 11.15. And what time is it in Italy right now? 7, 7.15? Yeah, 7.15. Yeah. And I just think that's so neat that I'm sitting here in the United States at – 11.15 in the afternoon on a Friday talking to you and uh, Europe. That's just the internet is so darn cool. So I only got you for um, six more minutes. It's uh, We're already 53 minutes into this. Uh, what? Anything else you want to talk about the last six minutes? Any other subjects you think you could shed light on? Well, uh, probably the last thing I want to talk about is that um, dental school. Dental schools in Europe. There are a lot of private dental schools in Europe, in Europe coming up. They're very good, um, uh, beautiful places, beautiful cities to visit also. And actually, if you want to go into dental school and you don't get into dental school in the States and you want to or you just want to experience coming abroad, we have some fantastic dental schools in Europe that are now private and very good, uh, like in Valencia, Madrid, Spain, uh, or Andorra. Uh, or in uh, there is one in France also that I know of. And all these dental schools are very high quality with, um, since they're private run, they can have the big professors they choose coming from all over the world for, for lectures. And it's fantastic. And you'll be very surprised if you go and check how they're doing in the Hungary and uh, Bulgaria, um, which were countries that we were not even thinking of 10 years ago that have fantastic uh, uh, dental schools now and medical schools also running. And of course, England. 
I, w- I want to go going back to changes between the United States and Europe, um, specifically to Italy. Um, in America, probably most of the pa- 80% of the patients that come to the dentist have insurance private from their employer. Um, is that the way it is in Italy? Or do is 80% of your patients coming to you and having insurance paid for by where they work to pay for part of the treatment? What, what, what is the insurance mechanisms like in Italy? Okay, let's say that uh, out of my patients, about 90%, 95 would not have any type of insurance. So I have, only have 5% of patients in which the insurance comes in and pays a part. I, I, in my office, I work with my wife. She's a dentist. She does all the bloody job thing. And um, she works with about 30% uh, of uh, insurances. So her, her job is 70-30 with insurance. Mine would be 95-5. So why do, why do you think that is? Why why do you think Americans, uh, you know, go to the dentist only if their employer is paying for part of it? And why do you see like, like you go to like Brazil and China, they don't even know what insurance is. So why 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 do you think American dentists think they have to do everything the insurance company says and just be totally insurance driven when you go to some of the greatest civilizations on earth and they don't even have dental insurance and people just pay for dentistry like they do their cars, houses, TVs, radios, iPhones. Why do you, why do you think that is? You think it's just cultural? Well, sometimes it's not, it's not wise to work with an insurance company. Like for example, I'll, I'll give you an idea of how it works here. Some people come in with their insurance and their insurance is willing to pay that fixed amount for the treatment, you know, and they don't, they don't want to add anything for the treatment. And if, if I'm willing to work with that insurance, I have to accept their policy, okay? Uh, for me, it's not convenient and uh, it's not worth it. So I, I will refuse uh, to, to, to have any, any contract with any of, the, any of these insurance companies. Uh, on the other hand, there are insurance companies that work in a more elastic way in which I do have confidence that I work with. I believe it's probably the same in the United States. I mean, if, if a doctor will not accept insurance, he'll expect the payment from the patient, and then the patient can do whatever he wants. I mean, I, I think there is still this liberty, or am I saying something wrong? No, I think you're on it. I, I got two more differences. Um, a, lot of, a lot of patients, or you hear people on the Internet say that uh, Europe is banning mercury amalgams. Um, but is, do you think that's true? Um, do you, do you see a lot less mercury now than when you came out of dental school? Um, are, there, are there any specific European countries that have outlawed and illegalized the use of an amalgam filling that has mercury in it? No, it's not outlawed in Europe that I know of. Maybe, maybe in a country, I, I don't remember, to tell you the truth. I can just tell you what my wife has been doing. It's been 20 years she's not using mercury. 20 years. And whenever she's taking away the old fillings, she has, you know, it's, it's like a, she looks like a neurosurgeon, you know, because the fumes, when you take out the old amalgam, you know, it can, they say it can harm you. And uh, yes, I believe they can harm you. And I believe that also sushi with tuna harms you because the amount of mercury in, 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 in tuna is over one milligram per kilogram. So that is very, very high amount. That's over any limit of any country in the world, but nobody talks about that. So we have mercury all over, and we want to, you know, reduce anyway the quantity of mercury we're coming in contact with. So the amalgam, the old amalgams had mercury, and we want to get rid of that stuff. And uh, it's not banned, but I know that at least 90% of the dentists I know do not use mercury at all anymore. 90% of the dentists that you know do not use silver fillings with mercury anymore. Absolutely. Okay, and then my last question, I only got you for one more minute. Uh, what is the status of wa- community water fluoridation in Italy? Do they add fluoride in the community drinking water to reduce decay or not so much? Okay, yes, they do. And um, it's it, every, every little community, okay, it can run uh, their own tests on the water and decide if 
uh, the, um, if chemicals, any type of chemicals that are added to the water are safe for the population or not. Now, in preventive medicine, we've seen that uh, adding fluoride reduces cavity. And we also know that um, in order for this to work, uh, people have to come in contact with a certain amount of fluoride during the year. Uh, uh, many towns and many cities now do not have fluoration of the water, but some still do. Now the problem is that uh, we've had a big problem, if uh, you can remember Chernobyl in uh, Russia when you know, we had the nuclear, uh, uh, the nuke problem over there in Russia. And the problem was that, with the, that the fluoride that was uh, being delivered uh, was thought to have uh, uh, a contamination um, from uh, uh, the spill out or the fallout, the nuclear fallout. So in that period, everything ended, you know, uh, fluoride treatment, whole fluoride treatment, and a lot of uh, fluoride added to the waters. And as of now, uh, any doctor knows that if you do not take your pill, fluoride pill, for at least 250 days out of a year, it, it won't change the outlook of cavities. And that's the same if you put fluoride in the water. If you do not have that contact, drink enough of that water, that will not provide any uh, preservation of uh, your beautiful teeth. And uh, so we are out of time, but, so, but I just got to ask you, you don't ever supposed to talk about religion, sex, or politics, or violence, but uh, since I went to Catholic school, my two older sisters, uh, Mary Kay and Jean Marie, went straight into the Catholic nunnery right out of high school. My oldest sister's been a cloistered Carmelite monk for longer than I've been a dentist. I have to ask you, uh, uh, what do you, what do you think of the new pope, Pope Francis? I mean, I just I just didn't see that coming. I mean, he is an international rock star. Would you say? Would you agree? Yes, he's very cool. Uh, Italians love him. He's really cool. I mean, he's uh, funny at times, you know, and he's uh, he's very close to the population. Um, uh, I I I am no um, no tech of religion. Okay, so I'm not, I, I don't go to church as much as I should. And, okay, and, and I cuss sometimes, okay, so, and I get mad at my child, so I'm not a, that, that good of a guy, you know, I can believe that. But, but Pope Francis is changing something. We're going into a change, and we still don't know what's going on. I mean, we know there's a big change coming. He's working at, uh, undercover, okay? like an undercover agent in the Vatican, and like an undercover agent around the world. And we'll have to just wait and see what this big change is about. Uh, I think finally we have a person who has the courage to a change, because that was the whole point. Nobody had the courage to change. And then i got to ask you one more politically incorrect question. Um, Americans are always wondering if the euro will stay together. And it seems like half the articles, you know, like when it's Greece or this, that it's going to fall apart. Then the other half the articles say it'll never fall apart. Uh, they love the common currency. Some people are saying that Europe doesn't even need a common currency anymore because it's it, we're now in a cashless society that just uses credit cards, and the credit cards have no problem converting currencies or whatever. But So i got to ask you the takeaway. Uh, 20 years from now, will the euro still be, the eurozone still be together, common currency, Brussels ahead, or do you see it um, crumbling apart and going back to individual nations? Well, that's a big question. I uh, know, I know. And I'm sorry I asked uh, it, but I, can't, I couldn't resist. Okay. Uh, I think it'll still be there. I think it'll still be there. Uh, for one simple reason, because... Uh, anything away from the prop, the situation, going back to the old era or to the old currency for any country, would not be something 100% positive. You know, there would be another big change. We already had the change with the euro, okay? And um, we only together, Europe together, can start uh, having a currency that can work with China and the United States properly. You know, there were too many differences before. So I think, yes, uh, everything is electronic, uh, you know, you don't need all the, that currency, but if you have three or four currencies around the world, and you know, without all the little small ones, 
you know, Italy was a small country, Spain was a small country, our currency was, you know, devaluated every year, so what was the use of it? On the other hand, uh, the problem of the European Union, maybe the currency is the last problem. We got bigger problems than currency. <laughs> well, I'll just I'll just leave on one note that I think is kind of humorous. You know, when they're always talking about the Greek bailout or, you know, the Greek debt or whatever. I think it's kind of funny because the United States is like a Eurozone. And we, we have states like uh, Kentucky that have lost money every single month. I mean, so the United States is, we just know that richer states like California and Connecticut are going to bail out states like Kentucky every year forever. I mean, some countries just, they just run at a loss and Greece just might be your Kentucky. <laughs> Someday you might just have to eat that bill. But hey, I'll tell you what, it is such an honor that you spent time with me. And I, I can't believe I got an orthodontist to talk to a low life general dentist like me. And uh, if you could ever put an online course on dental town, it'd be such an honor to have someone of your statue from Italy putting a course on uh, dental town. That would just be really, really neat. Howard. Okay. All right. Yeah. Howard, uh, um, there's two Howards at dental town. I'm Howard at dentaltown.com. Howard Goldstein does the online CE. So his email is hogo, H O G O at dentaltown.com. But uh, if you ever have time to put up any, any course you want on neuromuscular or uh, um, orthodontics interceptive for children in the rural practice or whatever you want to do, uh, thank you so much again for spending an hour with me. Thank you. You've been great. It's been fantastic to speak with you. Oh, thank you. Have a great day or good night. <laughs> if you ever come over, I'm waiting for you here. We go out to dinner and show you around a bit, okay? Well, you know what? I got four boys, and so, you know, we did tons of family vacations and all that stuff. But but on my um, lecturing, I like to take one with me at a time for just an individual father-son trip. And my oldest son, Eric, says his favorite vacation of all time was when I took him to Venice. Uh, when I lectured in Venice and I took Eric with me, um, he still talks about how he thought that was the coolest city he's ever seen. And that kid's seen a dozen countries. Okay, fantastic. All right, well, have a good day. Okay, bye-bye.